It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sam Strengths, who will be giving a talk about next generation materials for solar cells. So a bit of information about our speaker. Uh, Sam did their undergrad in Adelaide in physics and physical chemistry before becoming a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and working on carbon nanotubes. Then did a postdoc in the group of Henry Saith and began to work on uh, proskites, uh, which is a material with applications uh, mainly in photovoltaics and solar cells currently. Uh, following that, he then was a Mary, Mary Curie Fellow at MIT uh, and also had a venture into uh, entrepreneurship where a startup company of Swiss Solar was founded and uh, where it's still going strong. Uh, Sam then moved to Cambridge in 2017 to set up his group. Uh, and is now an assistant professor in the chemical engineering, engineering department. I'm also in his group uh, doing a research project on molecular doping. Um, and I can confirm that uh, Sam is an amazing mentor and a great inspiration to be around. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Sam Strank, giving his talk on next generation materials uh, for solar cells and light emitting dyes. Great, thank you. Okay, I think, yeah, I think I've got everything here. So thanks very much, uh, Tim, for the introduction, and thank you very much to CSAR for, for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, and it's great to see you all here in the audience and also those uh, watching on Zoom as well. Uh, so I will talk today on, um, yeah, I'll work on uh, next generation solar photovoltaics. Uh, so I'm going to sort of structure the talk, talk in two. I'm going to give a, sort of a, an overview of where we are at with solar photovoltaics. Um, what role it will play in decarbonisation. We all know it will play uh, a very important role. Uh, and then I'm going to move into the, the work that we're doing um, here in Cambridge on, um, on, on halide perovskites in particular. Uh, these materials are very interesting materials um, for photovoltaics. They're also actually applied in many other areas, including lighting and uh, detectors. I'm not going to talk so much about those applications today, but really focus on, uh, on, on the solar. Um, so just, just to start, um, and I might spring up the laser pointer on here, because I think if I use the laser pointer on there, the audience online won't be able to see. So excellent, we can see that. So just to, I suppose, give context to the enormous potential for solar, um, this, if this cube represents our, uh, how much sunlight's hitting the Earth, then this cube represents our global power demand. And so you can just see how much um, energy is coming from the sun and how much it really dwarfs is how much we actually need to provide. Uh, and when we put that in context, this, these are our current photovoltaic installations worldwide. So we're just under a terawatt, which is actually a, a phenomenal amount, but we do have um, a long way to go to um, at least provide the amount that we do need to provide um, based on decarbonisation uh, roadmaps. Um, and so the reality is PV is, um, it's already cost competitive in many places. So this is, uh, this is showing data for in the US in particular, and looking at the levelised cost of electricity of various energy sources. So we've got on the left sort of coal and gas, uh, and then moving towards um, renewables. And so you can see PV here, there's PV residential, commercial, and then utility scale. Um, you can see utility scale is really cost competitive um, with current technologies, and that cost is coming down faster and faster. Um, and of course, the lower, the lower we can make the cost of solar PV, uh, the more it can contribute to our energy solutions. Uh, and of course, a, a disclaimer here is that this levelised cost of electricity doesn't include intermittency. Um, and uh, of course, things like storage are also going to um, help solar even more, which can deal with some of these intermittency uh, issues. Uh, and so, and PV will be a re really will be a critical part of our of. of of decarbonisation and energy solutions. This is a plot showing uh, the um, carbon intensity of various energy sources. And it's not surprising to see uh, coal and gas um, on, on, on the left-hand side here being very carbon intensive. Um, perhaps a slightly surprising one is hydro, which actually has a very big error bar on it, um, which is surprising. But that that's, depends on whether it's, it's um, artificial hydro sort of, um, and, and there's a lot of emissions associated with microbes and, and other um, carbon masses that um, when you reclaim land and make artificial hydro compared to natural uh, hydro. But that, that, that's for a topic of another day. Um, but then moving across to here, you can really see the PV and, and other renewables. Um, just obviously they are very, very low in carbon intensity. Um, almost every carbon decarbonisation model shows that solar is going to play a huge role in, um, in, by 2050 in getting towards our decarbonisation goals. Um, and that's both in decarbonising decarbonizing electricity and transport. Uh, there's another number of other good benefits of solar, of course. There's public health benefits. Uh, the, 
this is one study showing if in the US, if 27% of the electricity was, was PV from PV by 2050, this would say alone save, um, uh, would, would give $167 billion in health benefits and also save, uh, save almost 60,000 lives. So, so that's a very strong argument for it. Um, and there's another interesting fact, thinking about energy security and equality. Uh, if you think about average over the year, the sunniest country, which is Azerbaijan, uh, it gets only four times more sunlight than uh, the cloudiest, which is Norway. So that discrepancy isn't really very much. When you compare that to uranium, for example, from those with the, the richest source of uranium versus the poorest, it's a, it's a factor of a thousand variation. Um, and if you think about oil, uh, it's a factor of a million between those with the, the richest sources and those with the lowest. Um, another interesting fact, of course, is that the lower GDP countries tend to be sunnier places and so actually are richer in, in solar resource uh, than, um, than, than the richer countries. And the good thing is we, we're, we are deploying solar very, very fast. We are deploying a lot of it. This is fantastic news and what needs to happen and it needs to continue to happen, in fact. Uh, and if we... Um, this plot here is showing that, in fact, every year we deploy more solar worldwide than, we, than, than for example, the International Energy Agency predicts. Uh, and so this is an interesting plot looking at, this is the cumulative solar uh, deployed uh, over the years. And in the, with these, these dashed lines here are the projections that the IEA uh, makes every year. And the black data here is the observed uh, observed, um, deploy, observed deployment. And you can see every year consistently we're, we're rolling out much more than they can predict. And that, in fact, this plot um, is, goes to 2018, and this has actually continued, this trend has continued uh, since then. Uh, and the reason for this is that the cost of PV has dropped um, in a, a, a huge amount over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, the cost of PV module per watt um, has dropped 100 times since 1980. Um, and actually, really quite remarkably, since 2010, it's dropped another factor of 10. Um, which is extremely good news and it's extremely exciting. It's what we need. And the real reason for that is it's, uh, well, there's two things. One is due to cost reductions in raw materials and manufacturing, so economies of scale as we roll more solar out. It's going to get cheaper, these, uh, the manufacturing and the, and the, the modules will get cheaper. Uh, and also R&D, so power conversion efficiency gains, so making these panels more efficient. Um, this has really driven down the cost. And that really, in many ways, it was unprecedented, this, this drop since 2010. And that's really driven this, this huge wave of, of solar that we're seeing roll, rolling out today. But the, the, the issue is the current PV technologies won't get us all the way there. So it's not, at least, it won't get us all the way there fast enough. And there's a few issues for that, uh, issues associated with that. One is um, that the, the non-module costs remain high. And so this is when we think about this, the PV system, we have the PV module that you can buy, but there's also the other, all the other costs. There's the wiring, the installation, there's also the, the inverter and various other components. These are, these are the balance of systems costs. And so this is a plot showing how in, um, this is in, in Germany, how rooftop systems, the module cost has come down remarkably. In fact, that's continued to, to drop. Um, at this, uh, this, the point when this plot was uh, made, this is a dollar per watt for the module cost. This is really now pushing, some of the panels are pushing down towards 30 cents per watt now for the module cost. Uh, but this balance of systems costs, all these other costs, this is much harder to, uh, to, to make inroads in, and that's really plateaued, and that's now really dominating, and in future will really dominate the cost of solar systems. And that's very hard to make inroads into without, um, without for example, efficiency increases. Uh, the other issue with, um, with, with, with the standard PV technologies, which is mostly silicon, is it's very high temperature to, pro you have to process a very high temperature to make very high purity silicon ingots, which can lead to these very highly efficient panels. Um, and this, this means factories cost a lot to build. There's very high capex associated with them. Um, this means it's energy intensive. It, it does limit the rate that we can deploy these. It limits the rate we can, we can build factories to roll out PV fast enough. Uh, and it also limits applications. And I'll talk a bit about some of the applications for PV beyond just rooftop, uh, rooftop and, and more traditional applications. Um, and I'm going to put one other thing here, which has really arisen more recently, which is some of the issues with geopolitical issues that, um, that we're seeing in the US, for example, is tariffs on, on panels coming in from China, for example. And this is, there's some issues over where some of these panels are being manufactured and the ethics associated with them. And so some of the, the cost of solar has actually increased because of that. Um, and there's also, with the, with the pandemic, there's been supply chain issues that have really, um, really been exacerbated. And, and so there, there are some issues with, with most of the PV being manufactured in only a few places. 
And so there is, um, there really needs to be um, a diversification of that um, going forward to really uh, de-risk um, any issues associated with that. And, and so really uh, what we need is we need solutions with higher efficiency, uh, more modularity, reduced costs, and also new manufacturing paradigms where we could build factories cheaper um, and build more of them. So just, uh, I mentioned that, uh, yeah, that, that most of the current technologies is crystalline silicon. So 95% of the market share of photovoltaic technologies is crystalline silicon. That's these, uh, these, these panels you see. So most of the panels you see on rooftops, um, there are uh, sort of roughly around 5% is, is, the thin, is a thin film technology, um, which is growing slightly, but really silicon does dominate. Um, and if we just, if we think about unpacking a panel uh, silicon panels, typically what, what happens is they make ingots of, uh, of silicon which are then cut into cells. So these, these cells are a particular size and these cells are then linked together to make uh, modules. And then these, finally, these modules are linked together to make uh, solar arrays. Uh, I mentioned this, the thin film technology, and this is more what, a bit of what I'll talk about today, some of the, the thin film light technologies where you can actually depot, you can make the panel, the entire module in one deposition. You don't need to, you don't need to uh, link the cells together. So this is a monolithic module. Um, these then uh, rack together to make an array. Uh, and if you, if you just look at what the panel is made of, we have these solar cells and the module linked together, and then typically they're encapsulated with glass to protect them. And, uh, and there's the back sheet and frame, and these are typically, typically racked onto, onto rooftops, um, which some of you will be aware of. Uh, and um, uh, and the, these panels are very good. They last for a long time. They'll, last, they'll typically be underwritten for 25 years, and in fact, most of them will last for 40 plus years, um, which is fantastic. And again, what we need for solar as we roll it out, we don't want to be having to replace it um, uh, soon enough, at least while the panels are very energy intensive to make and also while they remain um, uh, higher cost than they could be. So just to think about how these PV cells operate and, and this sort of uh, a prelude to, to into some of the work we're working on and, and what we're doing. So in its simplest form, we can think of a solar cell as essentially, uh, so we have two electrodes sandwiching some absorber layer. So we have an anode and a cathode and this absorber layer is um, absorbing the light that's coming in and it's generating energized, it's energizing electrons and holes and then we're collecting those as current and we're, we're generating both current and uh, photovoltage. And so for example here, so here we energize the electrons and holes and then they're being collected at the opposite electrodes and that, 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 that drives, um, that creates the photocurrent. And um, there's a number of aspects here that, uh, that we need to think about and there's a number of losses that can be um, that, that can be considered in these cells. And one is we have, to, we have to, of course, maximize how much light can be absorbed by the cell. So that's maximizing not only um, the light coming in, but also the color of the light so we can absorb as much as possible. Uh, also, when these, when these electrons and holes, when these charges get transported, I'll just play that again. When they get transported uh, along the way, they can hit defects and they can hit traps. And this means they lose their energy to heat, for example, and then that reduces the efficiency. Um, and so these are some of the things that we we're considering in these new materials, how to understand some of these defects and how to understand uh, many of these losses. So just in terms of some, some general considerations and, and thinking about solar in general, uh, this is the solar spectrum that we're trying to harvest. So this, uh, this blue one here is what the, the solar spectrum that we see uh, on Earth, the terrestrial spectrum. Uh, it peaks somewhere in the green, um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of light actually in the infrared as well that we want to harvest and ideally we want to harvest as much as possible of this. Um, but we need to absor design our absorber layer to, to absorb that light. And that absorber layer will be a semiconductor typically and will, it will have a band gap so it can absorb light as long as the energy of that light exceeds that band gap. And so for example, a lot of this infrared light won't be absorbed because it's not lot high enough energy to, be, to, to energize an electron. So what will happen is typically that uh, those infrared photons will pass through the cell and not be absorbed. So that's, that's essentially lost, um, that, that energy is lost and, and not able to be harvested. But if we come in with blue light, for example, we can then uh, excite, energize these electrons. There's enough energy to overcome, uh, to, to, to energize that electron, and that energizes uh, this electron, which is then collected, uh, collected at an electrode. Uh, we also leave behind a hole and that, that's also collected and we need to consider both electron and hole in terms of the um, collection of charge. 
One, one other note is that when we excite with blue light, for example, this, uh, this is too much, it actually excites above the band gap, and so a lot of this energy is actually also lost to heat. Um, and so there's, there's a bit of a trade-off and, um, and, and thermodynamic, there's a thermodynamic limit in terms of the efficiency of these cells that we can reach. Um, and so one consideration is we need to uh, harvest as much light as possible. So here, this is looking at um, the current density that we, so the current that we produce in the cell and in the, and essentially the band gap of the cell. And you can see if, if we want to make that band gap as small as possible to harvest as many photons as possible, including those infrared ones, and so that's, that's one, comp one, one consideration we need to make. But the other issue is that um, we also need a voltage. We need to produce a photovoltage. And for that, we need as high a band gap as possible. So there's a trade-off between them. For the current, we need a small band gap. For, for, the, uh, for the voltage, we need a high band gap. And of course, the power overall is, is the product of that current and voltage. So what ends up happening is you see there's, a, there's, a, there's an optimum band gap. So there's a compromise where somewhere around um, 1.2, 1.3 electron volts is the optimum band gap for this maximum efficiency. And this maximum efficiency is around 33%. So this is the maximum amount, um, uh, the maximum efficiency a solar cell can be um, due to all of these thermodynamic considerations that I talked about. For example, those photons that either can't be absorbed or those that are absorbed too high and then we lose some of that energy to heat. So that's an important factor. So 33% is the maximum for at least a single junction, single cell um, I'll show a couple of examples of how we can actually get around that limit uh, in some novel ways. Um, and just to give context to the amount of photovoltaic work that's going on around, around the world and many different technologies. So this is a, an extremely busy plot. I'm not going to go through it in detail. This is a, produced by the National Renewable Energy Labs in Colorado. And this is, these are all the different, these are the record efficiencies of the, the different photovoltaic technologies. And so silicon is in blue, some of these, uh, the, the, these blue curves. Um, some of the emerging technologies that I'm going to talk about down, uh, are down here, um, and including that, that yellow and red curve here. Um, and there's also some really highly efficient technologies here. So this is showing, this on the y-axis is the efficiency of these, these cells. These are multi-junction technologies where you use many, many different absorber layers. You can actually get up to efficiencies that are well above 50%, for example. And so the record is actually starting to approach towards 50%. Uh, but the issue is these are very expensive to make because they're very specialized semiconductors. And so typically they're only used in, in space applications where cost, um, at least so far, hasn't been as much of an issue. Okay, so I'm going to move now into some of the work we're doing on these halide perovskites. And um, I think one of the exciting things about these materials is it's, it's opened up a, a new world of tunable and high-performance semiconductors that we can, we can process really quite crudely and produce many, many defects, but these defects aren't re overall aren't that problematic. And so this is it's really, it's, it's, it's essentially been a paradigm shift in that most... Uh, most um, We've commonly thought of, um, to make a high quality semiconductor, you need to make a very perfect crystal with no defects at all. And that's been the sort of textbook understanding of semiconductors. Um, but in many ways, these materials are, are sort of ripping that textbook knowledge up in that we, we can make really quite dirty semiconductors, but they can perform really well. In fact, as good or even better than these extremely clean ones. Um, and so that, that, this is a really exciting shift. And, um, and, and it's enabled a lot of applications, so the photovoltaics that I'll talk about today, but also some of the other applications as well that, that I'll touch on towards the end, but won't focus on so much. Um, so what is, what is a perovskite? So uh, perovskite is actually anything that takes an AVX3 crystal structure. Um, it's, it occurs in many, many minerals, so it's a naturally occurring mineral with the AVX3 structure. In fact, it's the, um, one of the most abundant minerals in, in the Earth's crust. Um, but the so the materials that we work with for solar cells are a man-made version with different components than, than those naturally occurring minerals. So they are, they are ionic materials with typically, uh, they have, so there's, for the A site, there's typically an organic cation, so methyl ammonium, um, or an inorganic cation such as cesium. Um, B is a metal cation, so um, typically lead or tin. Um, and X is the halide. So these are typically metal halide perovskites, which, are, which we're working with. Um, and the reason they're generating a lot of excitement, I think, can be shown quite nice in this plot. So this is looking at the, the record power conversion efficiency of, of photovoltaic cells over the years. And you can see the silicon cells have, have improved steadily. And, and, and right now, the record cells are about 26.6%. 
uh, which is very good. As I said, they are very good cells. They are very good modules. They last for a very long time. Uh, but the exciting thing is these, these prof scuts have really shot up and it's really been over the last decade where they've actually been used in solar cells. And that, it's a really exciting trajectory here. And in fact, I, I need to even update this. As of a few weeks ago, that, that record now is at 25.7%, uh, uh, which is, uh, just shows how quick this field does move. Um, and I predict that by the end of this year, we probably will, it will have overtaken silicon, which is going to be a really exciting achievement. Um, so, yeah, I talked about the processing of these materials, so they can be processed uh, quite crudely, typically, and this is, this is actually how we make them in the lab. So we, uh, so we typically dissolve these, these precursor salts, so these metal halides and organic halides in, uh, in, in solvent, and then we cast them down on substrates and spin them at a few thousand RPM, and this forms really nice uniform films, uh, which you can see this is the yellow film here, and then we heat them gently, so at 100 degrees Celsius, to form these really crystalline uh, crystalline films that are the solar cell absorber. Uh, and to, in these, um, this 100 degrees Celsius is actually very low temperature for, for semiconductor processing when you compare to some of the 3.5 uh, 3 growth or silicon where it's sort of up, up to sort of around 900 to 1,000 degrees Celsius. It's a much, much lower temperature. Um, and so that leads to, it opens up applications in, uh, in manufacturing paradigms where we can think about printing on, on plastic, for example, or printing on metal foils and making flexible and lightweight uh, panels while still maintaining the high performance. And so this actually is a, a prototype roll-to-roll -roll processor. So think, thinking about printing like newsprint, a roll-to-roll -roll printer. Uh, this is actually making perovskite cells where you can see this is the, um, the preformed yellow film and then, uh, and then this is the... Um, the, the nice crystalline film that's been heated uh, to form the absorber. Um, and this is, of course, a much cheaper way of processing than, um, than many other semiconductors. Uh, the other interesting thing is we can tune the components and the chemical composition of these materials, and that leads to very um, interesting and, and quite important changes in their properties. So one, for example, is changing the band gap. I talked at the start about the band gap and the color of these cells. Uh, so you can actually change. This is... This is actually changing the halide component. So here we have an iodide perovskite, and as we add bromide, we start to change the band gap, and we move to something that's more yellow and, and yellow absorbing. Uh, and this this is quite interesting for coloured photovoltaics, for example. So building integrated PV, which is um, sort of a, grow, a growing application space for PV. This, this you can think about designing the PV panels to fit the building, uh, rather than sort of something that you put on the roof and and and, and not think about. And one of the quite important things about being able to tune the color or tune the band gap is that it, you can make uh, multi-junction cells from these. So we can, I, I spoke at the start how there's an efficiency limit of 33% with one, one junction. So one of the ways around it is to actually uh, to have two cells harvesting slightly different regions of the solar spectrum in what's called a tandem solar cell. And this efficiency limit can then go beyond the 33%. In fact, the theoretical efficiency limit moves more towards towards 50%. And the concept here is that you, uh, the, the bluer wavelengths here are, um, are harvested by the, the, by the top cell that's, that's made to, uh, to really harvest these blue wavelengths, but then the redder wavelengths and the near-infrared passes through and, and is absorbed in the bottom cell. And so by harvesting the, the complementary regions of the solar spectrum, you can push this efficiency limit uh, beyond the standard and so just to, to um, uh, for example, so thinking about perovskite tandems, so these perovskite, perovskite tandems, there's a, a, a practical, or at least a, a realistic practical efficiency that these could reach will be 35%, for example. Um, and this doesn't really seem like much, but when we think about PV and the economics of PV and the fact that you're generating power for, for many decades, this is actually a huge um, cost, this would lead to a huge cost reduction in, um, in photovoltaics. Uh, and there's a few parameters, a uh, few uh, calculations here, for example, that, that give you a, a flavor for that. This is, for example, the energy payback time uh, can be brought down quite dramatically compared to silicon, uh, and also the greenhouse gas emission factors when you think about manufacturing these cells and the carbon embodied in making them, you, you can reduce them down. Um, and to be fair, just to say this is also actually not very high overall, especially when you compare it to other energy technologies, but it does, it does bring it down even further. Um, and so one of these, one of the concepts of the tandems is actually 
not, not having two perovskite layers, but actually having a perovskite layer on top of, on top of silicon. So taking the existing technology and, and essentially boosting the efficiency. And so this is an interesting concept that, um, that um, so here, we, this is a diagram of it here, when we have this, the perovskite cell uh, on top, again, harvesting the blue wavelengths, and then these red wavelengths pass through to, uh, to the bottom cell here. Uh, and so these, um, so these are one of the, will likely be one of the first commercial products, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few moments. Uh, and so I, I spoke, at the uh, spoke earlier about the, the potential for lightweight solar and flexible solar, for example. And one of the really exciting things about the perovskites here is that you can, um, you can still achieve that with the high performance as well, the high power. And so this can enable a number of new markets. And there's sort of some, uh, maybe some wearable PV, which, which maybe is a bit more of a niche market. But one of the exciting, really exciting things is thinking about um, new installation regime, uh, paradigms for installing solar, so rolling them out like a tarp, rather than the racking that you need to do with silicon panels. Uh, and there's also other applications, as, so space applications is quite an interesting one as well, where high power to weight is, is very important, uh, and also some aerial communications as well, which is a, a growing market. Uh, and one of the, I think, really, um, really important applications is actually uh, boosting the range of electric vehicles. So here, um, adding um, a high power but lightweight solar panel into the, integrated into the rooftop is something that uh, many car manufacturers are very excited about. Uh, in, so for example, in, at least in a sunny place, you can boost the range by about 30 miles in a day, which is a typical commute for many people. Um, so this uh, means so without plugging in. So this, this is something that really could change uh, and, and, and boost the deployment of um, electric vehicles. Um, so there's some of these applications as um, We've been uh, developing through Swift Solar, the um, startup company that uh, Tim mentioned at the start, and I'll, I'll have a slide on that um, in a few moments as well to tell you a bit more about that. Uh, and so one of the other, so efficiency is one thing, but the other kind of side to it is reliability and, and, and stability of the cells. And this is something that really has, it's improved a lot. So in the earliest days of the Proscite cells, they were efficient, but they were very unstable. Uh, these have got, this has gotten a lot better over um, over the last few years, and in fact, in the last couple of years, we're really seeing some really exciting progress in this space. So these are typically, in the labs, what, what we and others do is stress these cells under elevated temperature and elevated uh, and, and, um, and full sunlight um, under continuous operation to really stress them and assess their performance. And a lot of these are now passing many of these standard um, IEC tests at the um, uh, so the International Electrochemical uh, Society defines all these tests that need to be done, and they're actually passing a lot of these tests, which is quite exciting. So this is, this is one where it's operating for 2,000 hours continuously without um, really any drop in efficiency. Um, and this is one actually for 9,000 hours, which is sort of getting towards um, sort of a year. And there is actually some more field data that's um, that with, with quite long lifetimes, and this is actually a mini module where it's, um, this is a, it's a, I, I think this one was a 60 centimeter squared mini module that's maintaining its performance um, over a thousand hours, which is again, something really quite exciting. But I'll pick up a bit on, a bit more on stability um, in, in the talk. Uh, <clears throat> and so in terms of commercialization, so it's really, it's in the earliest stages, for, at least for, for PV, uh, and um, in fact, we saw some of the first products coming out last year. Uh, so this, um, so Oxford Photovoltaics is a company from, uh, from uh, Henry Snaith spun out in Oxford. They have a 100 megawatt uh, production line that's in Brandenburg in Germany, and that's um, started producing panels. And I believe this year they're, they're aiming to make their first, sell their first products. This is looking at perovskite silicon. So I talked about the perovskite on top of silicon. And so that's quite, some quite exciting uh, progress there. Uh, so microquanta semiconductor in China has also got a production line that they're rolling out. Um, quite a few panels. There's a few other companies. So Solay Technologies is producing some solar blinds and some more, um, so, so, some more um, kind of uh, uh, um, more niche applications. Um, and also Swift Solar have been um, developing the high power and lightweight uh, applications. Um, so just briefly on Swift, this is who we are. So we were founded in, in 2017. Uh, and um, based in, in California with some activities in NREL as well in the US. Uh, we, so we've grown quite a bit over the last few years. So we're now 21 employees uh, and we've raised um, various amounts through both 
sort of more traditional VC and, uh, and um, private equity uh, and grants. And we've got an R&D lab in, in San, San Carlos in California, 10,000 10, square foot facility, um, and starting to, to make um, a small, uh, small prototype line, starting to make themselves um, and looking um, in the next few years to, to um, produce the pilot line to start producing more of these panels. Um, our aim is to really look at the high performance and, um, and lightweight aspects of these, of these cells. <clears throat> okay, so to change gear now to the challenges and, and a lot of what we're doing in the lab to try and tackle some of these challenges. So I, I've painted quite a rosy picture of these materials and these cells, but of course there's still lots of work to be done to really make sure that they can play a big role in this de decarbonization effort and to really, um, uh, to, to really roll out on a large scale. Uh, and so this is, I mean, three challenges. There are others, but I'm going to focus on these in particular. So how, how do we take efficiencies to and above these traditional limits? So there, is still, there are still efficiency losses. We're not yet at the limits we could be at. Um, particularly in these tandem cells, there is a lot more efficiency gain to be had. The best perovskite silicon tandems are now at about 29%, um, which is very good, but they could reach something like 35%. And the perovskite perovskite tandems that are about 26%. So again, um, a, a long way to go. Um, <clears throat> so one of the big challenges is a lot of, uh, I mean, our group and many other groups do work typically on prototype cells that are sort of one inch square uh, in, the, in the lab. So there's the key challenges of how do you scale that up and, and maintain that performance you can get in the lab on the much larger scale. And finally, how to make these devices reliable and long-lived. And that's something really important that um, to, to really play a role that they need to last for, for years. There is a high benchmark set by the silicon panels um, and, and therefore um, th there is some way to go to make sure we can, we can at least make these competitive and uh, with these other cells. Um, okay, so on to, to who we are. So this is our group. So we're based in um, the Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology Department at the University of Cambridge. Um, we have also strong links to the Cavendish as well. Um, we are quite an eclectic mix of, uh, of backgrounds. So we've, physicists, we've got physicists, chemists, material scientists, chemical engineers, electrical engineers, working on a different aspects of these materials, understanding them all the way through to making cells and, and, and really the sort of applied side of them, of this. Um, we always, um, we, like any solar group or any photophysics group, we always have our excited state photo as well as a, a ground state and excited state. So this is uh, obligatory in this field. Um, and yeah, so in what we, what we work on, or at least one of the, I suppose the things that underpins a lot of our work is, is looking at um, spectroscopy of these materials. So using light to understand how these materials work, how they harvest, uh, how they harvest light, how they then energize electrons, and how these electrons and holes are collected. Um, and we typically use fast pulses of light to understand this. So we energize the sample, and then we look at the decay of that, um, of, of those charges over time to understand, um, to, to understand more about these materials and these cells. Uh, and one of, the, one of the really important techniques that we use, or, or aspects that we look at, is, is looking at luminescence. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that, to think that we actually look at the light coming out of the solar cell to understand them, but this is um, actually a really important factor of them. So we, we shine light on them, and then we, we, we look at the light coming back out. And the reason is because when you shine light on a semiconductor, when you energize these electrons, and if you don't collect those charges, then eventually those charges will recombine and emit light again. And so that's, that's a process that will happen. It's something that um, you can't get around, and... That's, in fact, in many ways a good thing. That tells us our semiconductor is behaving well. But there are other situations where we might have charged traps. So if we, if we energize the sample and then those electrons get trapped in these defects and then they lose their energy to heat, then we won't be getting light out. So what that tells us is that this light is a very good probe of, of losses and a probe of, of when we have traps and defects in these materials. Uh, and it's actually really interesting that we really want to have efficient luminescence in a solar cell that to reach our performance limits, we actually need to make our solar cells very good LEDs. So in other words, they need to also emit light very well when they're operating under certain conditions. 
Um, and so just a, a, a few examples of ways where we're looking at how these uh, electrons um, are energized and how they travel. So this is a, a study where we were looking at, uh, we, we excite the sample from one side. This is a, a cross section of the solar cell essentially, or at least half the solar cell with one electrode on top. And we energize these electrons and we, uh, we, 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 this is with a pulse of light. And then we look at the light coming out over time. And so that there is over, this is over nanoseconds. So um, it's a billionth of a second, a nanosecond. So this is over very, very fast time scales. And so that's one thing. We, we look at the light coming out um, if we don't have any electrodes. And then we put an electrode on here. And what that tells us is when that electro electron hits that electrode, it will disappear because it will be collected. And so that's, um, we see a faster luminescence here because we're losing some of the carriers through that process. And so we can model that and we can, um, we can, we can model these charges moving around the material um, in different situations. And from that, we can extract how far these charges can travel. And it turned out one of the um, quite exciting early discoveries was we found that these, these electrons could travel actually very microns, micrometers in these samples, which doesn't seem like very long, but actually it's, it's, it's quite a, a long way for a charge to move without hitting a defect or without losing its energy to, to heat. And so to put that in context, this solar cell absorber layer is about 500 nanometers thick. So that, what that tells us is that when we excite from one side, that electron can easily traverse the cell and be collected without, without being lost or without losing its energy to heat, for example. And so that means we can design these solar cells in a very simple sandwich structure way. We don't need to think about more complicated ways to extract those charges. Um, and that simplifies the processing, for example. So another key thing of what we, uh, a key part of what we do is looking at these, uh, these defects. I mentioned that a few times in the talk so far. Uh, and so here, this is actually zooming in with a microscope and looking at these, the, the light coming out from these materials. Um, so this is a, a, a fo what's called a photoluminescence map of these materials. And it's um, these materials, when you zoom in, they're, they're sort of mosaic grains uh, for, uh, of these materials. And what's quite interesting is when we look at the light coming out from some regions, it's very dark and poorly luminescent. And so if you remember, that's when we have lots of defects that, that will cause the luminescence to be, to be dim. But then there's other regions that have a really bright and very emissive, and that's, that's very good, and that's what we want uh, in these materials. So the idea is we would have uh, a uniformly bright image, in fact, for an ideal solar cell. So this tells us when looking at this solar cell that we have some way to go. We can improve this still further, and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, we're doing some, um, we're using some interesting techniques where we can actually do this in three dimensions as well. So not just looking at, at, at sort of a surface map, we can actually take maps at different depths in the, in the semiconductor and then reconstruct a 3D image of these materials. And so these are some crystals, uh, that, um, of perovskite crystals. And I think I may have to switch back to, if this will work, I have to switch back to my mouse. There we go. So what this is, is in the, these are snapshots in time when we excite the sample and we look at the light coming out over nanoseconds and the top left, that's the time stamp. And so what this is showing is that there's lots of variations across these crystals and across this film. So there's some regions, this is looking at a snapshot at 30 nanoseconds where there's still some light coming out of some pockets, but in other pockets it's all decayed away. And so again, where there's light coming out still, this is, this is a good um, material, this is a good part of the material, there are fewer defects, but in many of the regions where we don't have color there, or we don't have light, we have, uh, we, we're still having, uh, we have lots of defects. Um, and this is useful because we can start to probe buried interfaces under the solar cell. Because a lot of techniques typically just look at the surface, we can actually start to probe what's happening further in and also underneath on the bottom layers. Um, and so, yeah, looking at, um, again, on the sort of theme of microscopes and, and zooming in on these, this is looking at them with electron microscopes. And, and again, there's, there's a really surprising amount of heterogeneity in, the, in, their, in their properties on these length scales. So here, this is looking at sort of tens of micrometers and gradually zooming in. And you can just see how much variation there is in these, in the sort of these mosaic grain structures. And in fact, this is zooming 
to right in onto sort of the these um, so, so these mosaic grains, but zooming in to look at even within these grains, there's also variations. So we have these subgrain variation as well. Um, and again, all of this is very surprising in that they still perform very very well in spite of this heterogeneity. Um, so this has been a really fascinating question for us: Why do they work so well, even though we have a lot of this heterogeneity here? Um, and of course, the, so this heterogeneity is mostly benign, but there is still a nature of this that, that means there are some losses associated with them. So it, a lot of what we're trying to do is understand this heterogeneity to be able to then understand what is essentially what is good and what is a, a bad variation in, this, in these material properties. Uh, and so we do this by probing the samples with various techniques. And, and typically what we do is we'll, we'll, in a microscope, we'll perform a, a certain technique and then we'll, we have ways of, of marking where we've mapped and then we can move to another technique and actually look at that same scan area with a different technique. And so we may be able to understand, for example, what are the structural properties and then move to another technique and look at what the chemical properties are of those materials and then move to another microscope again and look at the luminescence, for example. And so this is, this is called multimodal microscopy where we're starting to build up um, information on these, on these materials um, in, um, about different properties of these materials. Um, and this is actually one, one example. This is some work we're doing in collaboration with, with Okinawa in, in Japan where we're looking at um, what's called photoemission microscopy. And what this does, I don't want to go into too much detail with it, but essentially what it does is it can probe bound electrons in the, in the material. So we come in with some light and we, we, we photo emit, um, sorry, that isn't, yeah, there we go. Um, we photo emit electrons and we can, we can understand where they are, how deep they're bound in the semiconductor. And the important thing is we can look at uh, electrons that are bound in trap states, for example, so they're sitting in these trap states, or electrons that are in the material, in what's called in the, in the valence band. Uh, and because it's in a microscope, we can also understand exactly where they're coming from, spatially on the sample. And so this is an example where we're, where we're using this, this technique to just look at the trap states. So this is a, a map across the film. This scale bar here is a 500 nanometer, 500 nanometer um, scale bar. And the color you're seeing there are actually trap states. So we're imaging these nanoscale trap states, trap states um, spatially, which is really quite exciting because um, um, to get to these length scales with this technique is a really, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, but also we're starting to see that these trap states, and so for example, those luminescence maps I showed, they actually come from these really tiny, tiny trap clusters that are on the nanoscale. And in fact, are something like 10 nanometers in size. Uh, and we can actually do that. So again, exciting with a pulse of light, and we can actually look at these carriers trapping in real time. So I'm going to play a movie. So what happens here, this is in picoseconds. It's a very short time scale. Zero picoseconds, we excite the sample, we energize charges, and what you're seeing in the dark regions is those charges trapping in these sites. And this is actually, a, a, it's, well, in many ways, a staggering measurement to be able to visualize in real time these charges trapping on these, on these really, really small length scales. Um, and so this is, um, yeah, just a, a still image where we can look at a region that has, has lots of these traps. So it's, we look at the luminescence, and it's, put, and it's not very emissive. And then we have these lots of these these, these trap states there, um, and we can see that these trap states actually lead to to poor luminescence. So that they, um, this is actually a, a, where we've overlaid the, the light coming out, the luminescence with these trap states. So the trap states are in blue, and the luminescence is in this sort of um, black to yellow color scale. And you can see that they anti-correlate quite strongly. Where we see poor luminescence in general, um, you see lots of these these trap states and these trap clusters in blue. Uh, and so we, we weren't content with just seeing the trap states. What we want to, what we want to understand is actually why these trap states form in the first place. What are these, uh, what are these, um, what are they arising from? And so we've turned to, um, this is a collaboration with Paul Midgley in, in materials here in Cambridge. We've turned to a technique called scanning electron diffraction. And so this is, uh, this is, looking at materials with electron microscopy. And the particularly nice thing about this is these have direct detectors. So we can, um, we send electrons through and we detect them on the other side. And we, that means these direct detectors are extremely sensitive 
So we can actually come in with a very low dose of electrons and still get very good signal out. And this is, this is important because these materials, because they are ionic, they're quite soft materials, and typically they'll be subject to beam damage if we come in with too high, too high a flux of electrons. So this allows us to probe them without changing the sample. And so that was a very important step in, 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 in understanding them. Uh, and the other advantage of this technique is you really get lots of information from it. So this is an electron microscope image of these, of these grains. So we've zoomed right in. This is actually looking at a single grain and even the subgrain kind of behavior that's happening there. And then on the right-hand side, this is, uh, this is a diffraction pattern coming from, so it's, it's lagging a little bit. So this is a diffraction pattern that we're detecting from this electron microscope from each point on that sample. So as that red dot scans across, it gives us what the diffraction pattern is. So from every single spot on that, uh, on that region on the left, we're getting a, a diffraction pattern. And what a diffraction pattern can tell us is about the structure of the material at that point. And you can just see, even just as you zoom across, just how, how much variation there is as you zoom across this grain boundary and across this material, um, which again is, is fascinating considering they are working very, very well. And, um, and so what we've, we've been recently connect, um, uh, connecting is actually what these trap clusters are. And um, this is actually some work that came out, in fact, just, just before Christmas, just, just gone last year, um, which we're really quite excited about, where what we actually find is that some of these, um, this is a, a, a scanning electron microscope image of, of the perovskite. And in most places we see, um, when we look at the, um, actually that's lagging a bit, there we go. When we look around the, the, the material, we see the diffraction pattern corresponding to the perovskite. So we, we know it's quite nice pristine perovskite. But every now and again, we see a phase impurity. So these are, we've shaded in yellow here. And these are um, different phases of the perovskite. Um, and they're actually called um, hexagonal polytypes. So they're slightly more complicated structures. I'm not going to go into too much detail with. Um, but what they are is that they're not absorbing perovskite. They're a different phase. And these are actually the, what's leading to these trap states. So these, these trap states that I was talking about before. And so you can see they're really tiny. They're sort of on the order of, uh, of tens, tens of nanometers in size. And in, in, in many of the sort of macroscopic techniques, so when we use most techniques, we've, we've missed these, so we don't see them. But you can see with these sort of techniques, we are starting to see these tiny little kind of residual uh, blemishes that remain after processing. Uh, and these, these are important for the trapping that I just showed before, um, but they're actually extremely important for, uh, for, for stability as well. So they impact performance, but they actually also impact the stability of these cells and the reliability. And I'll show you one example here. So this is actually an experiment uh, um, where we, um, we, we illuminate the sample and we actually we, we map the sample with an electron microscope. We take it out and we, we illuminate the sample and then we actually put it back in and we find the same area and we, and we measure again. Um, and I'm sorry, I, that, that, that's, it's quite small here, but this, the next one has a zoom in of some of this re, these regions. And so on the left, that's before the light um, an extended duration of light, and then on the right is after. And what you see is, so here we have these regions that are these, these impurities, these hexagonal polytype impurities. And after we operate, what we find is we have lots of degradation specifically at these sites, so specifically at these, these, these inclusions, these, these, um, these phase impurity sites. And in fact, it, we have material loss at these sites as well. We start to form little pinholes that end up degrading the cell. And we see that with different, different types of, uh, of, of impurity. There's a few other ones. This is actually a metal, uh, a, a lead iodide impurity. We also see the sim a similar thing. And we even see this with a, a quite a, a more complicated junction. So here, this is actually a, a meeting between two perovskite grains, and there's a little uh, polytype impurity sitting between them in yellow there. Um, so I'll bring my mouse up again. Moving quite slow there, there. Maybe I'll use the, the laser pointer. Uh, and so, so here you can see um, this little impurity sitting there in yellow. And as we illuminate, what happens is we, we have, again, material loss at that site, so where the yellow impurity is. But we even start to have some eating away of the perovskite grain, which is shaded in green here. And so that's actually showing that these, these, poly, the, these impurities are really what's seeding the degradation in these cells. So they're extremely important, not just for performance, but also for for stability of the cell. 
Um, and just, yeah, to kind of, to understand exactly what's causing that, so we've, what we actually see is um, the structure of this perovskite, and it's been widely, uh, at least the, the, the high performance perovskites that have been used in most solar cells uh, at the moment, they're typically these alloyed systems where they're actually slightly quite complicated alloys of, of different um, acyte cations and mixed halides as well. And these have empirically worked the best for, for performance. What we find actually is these materials actually have, um, so they've been widely thought to be cubic, which is a, so the crystal structure is a perfect cube. But actually what we've found is that there's, there's a slight amount of octahedral tilt in these materials. And it's actually really, really slight. It's about two degrees. So they're just slightly off cubic. So they're actually what's called tetragonal. And what we've found is that this tetragonal phase, um, it's much harder for that to convert to these impurity phases than, in, than if it's cubic. And the other aspect to that is we've found that um, where, where it is... Um, where it is slightly tilted, where it's tetragonal, it's where we have some of these other cations, so these very small fractions of cesium and methyl ammonium around the place that, um, that cause it to be slightly tilted. Um, but we have some pockets where we, have, where we don't have those cations, and that's, um, I'll use the laser pointer, that's in this top right map. We can see that there's this former medinium cation, which is, um, which is the kind of the majority cation in this film. Um, it's really rich at these sites here, and that's, um, those are cubic sites, so they don't have the stabilizing cesium or other cations, and then they convert very, very quickly to these polytypes and lead to the traps. Um, so the take home from that is that these, these stabilizing cations or other additives that we put in to make these more stable, they must be spatially homogeneous everywhere. You can't afford to have little pockets where we don't have these, uh, these cations, and therefore they, they form these, these traps. And so this has really important implications for manufacturing because it means um, we, we are going to have to make them very precisely in terms of their composition. Um, and some of this heterogeneity I've shown, we may not be able to get away with a lot of it. We really have to hone the composition and, and the material to make it more homogeneous, um, at least on the manufacturing line. Um, and, and just finally on this part, um, so I've talked about chemical disorder and, and, and that being quite bad. We also have an example where there's, there's some good chemical disorder, and this is actually more thinking about some of the halides and, and the, the bromine and iodine. Um, at the start, I told you that the bromine and iodine can change the band gap. So if you have different fractions of bromine and iodine, you can get different band gaps. And so what we've found actually is, uh, is with, these, with these materials, so just looking down the bottom here, we have very subtle variations of bromine and iodine across the film. And this can lead to, this can lead to sort of band gap um, funneling of charges where carriers move from um, regions that are the higher band gap to lower band gap and then they recombine um, very relatively. And we've actually found this is actually a good thing because what it does is we have a lot of the recombination happens on these slightly lower band gap sites. They're actually slightly iodine rich and this, um, this means that they emit light really well but it also means that it pulls charges away from the traps which are, which are actually in other regions. So there's a funnel that's able to move the carriers onto the, these lower gap sites. And so this has actually been beneficial in um, the solar cell. So what, what this means is it's quite complex, this interplay between some of the good heterogeneity and, and chemical variations and some of the bad heterogeneity that are associated with traps. And there'll be some compromise where we have to hit to get high performance, but also high stability. Um, okay, and I'm just going to sort of finish on some of the topics that we're, we're doing around, around addressing some of these defects. Um, so we know a lot more now about what's causing them, where they're coming from, and so now it's really allowing us to sort of target more systematically how to um, address these. Uh, and one of them is looking at different um, additives and post-treatments, and this is just one example where we can take this map on the left where it's quite, quite heterogeneous and, and, and a lot of... Um, a lot of sort of dark regions, and then we, 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 we do various treatments. Um, this one specifically is actually a light treatment, um, a light soaking treatment. You can see it really brightens these grains, and it's much more homogeneous as well. Uh, and that leads to a much better solar cell uh, as well. Um, this is one example uh, where we've been looking at potassium salts. And in fact, potassium salts are able to, um, to, to, uh, um, to 
sit at these boundary sites. So a lot of these traps that I've talked about actually sit near the surface. And so this potassium, these potassium salts, this is a cross section of, uh, of one of these solar cells. And you can see the potassium is sort of decorating the green boundaries and, and the surfaces. And so this, um, the, these, this potassium is actually able to passivate and to, to treat some of these defects. And so it's, it's a relatively complicated mechanism associated with, with sort of managing the halide. So it binds to some of the excess halide, which can be associated with the traps and, um, and, and helps to prevent, uh, prevent these tra charge trapping um, um, processes. And this also leads to high efficiency solar cells. So at the time, this is about close to 22% efficiency, um, which is a really good, um, uh, really good performance. As you can see, it, it moves very, very quickly, these efficiency numbers. Um, and just kind of to give an overview of some of the things now we're, we're working on is we've, we've found some um, agents that are able to, uh, to, to selectively grow films that have this octahedral tilt in them. So rather than relying on, on the sort of cations arranging themselves in a homogeneous way, we can actually selectively grow them to, to induce tilt. And so this is quite exciting and, and there's going to be some, um, I think, some interesting progress in this space and, and particularly with combining them with the cations and these tilting agents to, um, to really improve things. Um, I talked a bit about the, the requirement to scale up these devices and a lot of what I've talked about so far has been solution process cells, but there's also, um, we can vapor process these cells as well. So this is where we have these precursor salts in, uh, in, in these um, little vessels here and we can then sublime the material onto the film and this is actually quite a, um, a typical processing method in, in semiconductor, um, in processing semiconductors. And here we can actually make really quite uniform films in this way. So without having some of the solution where there's some difficulties with the drying and how, and how the solvent can homogeneously dry across the film, um, this can, can, can in principle get around some of that. And so this is some work actually we're doing here in Cambridge, um, the, the Henry Royce Institute um, uh, cluster, where we were able to process these really quite homogeneous films so this, this is um, an example here of a flexible film, which is about 10 by 10 centimeters, which is extremely homogeneous. And this together with some of these additives and, um, and these tilt agents could be a really promising uh, way forward. Um, and I, I talked about um, space applications and it's a good way to sort of, towards the end to, to look up and think about things in space. And uh, one of the um, really important things about a space PV cell is it needs to, survive very high energy protons. It needs to be able to, and, and other radiation. And so when we, this is, these are some experiments actually where we've been bombarding them with high energy protons and looking at their performance. And so this is actually looking at a, um, a specific tandem solar cell. It's a perovskite um, CIGS, so it's another thin film technology. And what we see is actually when we, when we operate them, um, even at extremely high doses of protons, they don't change, they don't, they, their performance doesn't drop at all. And so this, this is very promising. Uh, for, for space applications. When we, when we compare it to silicon, for example, this, uh, this one here, you can see the performance drops very, very quickly, in fact. And this is because silicon isn't very tolerant to defects. When, when a proton comes in and, 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 and causes a defect, that defect will really kill the cell performance. Whereas in the perovskites, there's, um, it's not clear they, they form that many defects because it's a, a softer material and it sort of has some, uh, it can sort of self-stabilize a bit. But even when it does form a defect, these defects don't seem to be as bad as in, in, in silicon cells. Uh, in fact, very recently, we've also seen that with um, perovskite, perovskite cells as well, where we, we see, uh, where we see extremely good performance. Um, this is actually comparing it to a commercial 3.5 triple junction technology. Uh, I'm gonna use the pointer again. So that, this blue curve here, this is actually the, the current commercial space technology that's used and actually, um, this, this is actually going to a very high dose, but that is dropping off much, much faster than this perovskite, um, than this perovskite cell, which is very promising. Uh, and then just finally, I, I wanted to just touch on some of the, the, the other space where we're working um, on these perovskites. So X-ray detectors are something really interesting as well, particularly for medical imaging, where these materials, not, so they can absorb visible light well, but they can also attenuate X-rays very well. And so we're looking at them for um, either directly collecting charges or emitting light in X-ray detectors. Um, there's some interesting commercialization um, in that area as well. Uh, also displays and lighting these, uh, because I mentioned at the start or earlier that um, 
they, these solar cells uh, should also be good LEDs. It turns out they also do emit light very well and also at different colors, so they're very promising for displays uh, and, and lighting spaces. Um, quantum devices as well, this is looking at single photon emitters, which are um, uh, building blocks for future qu um, quantum computers and other information, uh, quantum information technologies as well. And this is particularly in, we can make these materials in, in nanocrystal forms as well, which, are, um, which, which can be really quite exciting. Uh, and finally, we actually have an interesting project with, um, this is with, uh, so the, the Center for Global Equality here in Cambridge and also with Bahi Da University, where we're making these, uh, these cells in, um, into, for, for solar water pumps. So here, this um, a, a flexible and lightweight perovskite solar module can be moved around a farm much easier for pumping water. And this alleviates having to manually pump water in these boreholes in Ethiopia. Um, we're making some good, good progress on, on putting together a, a prototype working prototype of that, of that cell. Um, I wanted to finish on a uh, just sort of perspective of where things are going so I, and, and what we're sort of where we're looking towards. So I showed a lot of correlation measurements where we take different measurements on different scan areas and um, what we're doing is building this towards sort of pipelines to be able to really understand many different materials and, um, and so sort of this is looking at mapping different areas of, of different materials, um, looking at identifying different structures and different phase impurities, for example, and that's both in, on, the sort of, um, on the sort of grain level, but also we're trying to push this towards atomic scale mapping as well, and then, and then looking at how that could combine with some of the photophysical measurements to really understand performance and how these structural properties affect performance. And this can really have a lot of applications in, not just in solar cells, but also in a number of other spaces. So thinking about healthcare for detectors, um, hardware with transistors, uh, transport and lighting. So we're quite excited about some of the things that we could do with some of these techniques. Um, it really is some of the cut, cutting edge um, instruments that, um, and, and particularly low dose instruments that are allowing a lot of, us, a lot of these, um, uh, these really nice measurements. Um, so I'll finish there and just to give a sort of perspective. So I've shown you about the promise for halide perovskites uh, for really taking the baton for silicon. It's not, it's not something that will, they'll, they'll completely, um, the, the, they'll, um, you know, that the it's sort of one or the other. We really need both technologies. We need silicon to be rolling out solar, uh, so silicon solar as fast as possible. And then perovskites in sort of a decade when they can get to scale to really take the baton and, and take us um, and, and, and boost us towards the 2050 goals. Um, we're seeing the first products emerge this, last year and there'll be more this year. Um, I talked a bit about this, the heterogeneity on different length scales and how important that is and how these nan nanoscale trap clusters are um, problematic for performance and reliability. Uh, there's still work to be done on particularly on understanding failure mechanisms, not just on the sort of nanoscale, but also in the sort of cell and module level. Um, there also needs to be more work on life cycle analysis of these materials and, and recycling. And I think there's a really exciting opportunity because this technology is sort of, um, you know, at the early stage, it really means we could, um, we, we could um, build in recycling paradigms from the outset. So make sure these panels are actually able to be recycled. Um, whereas, because at the moment, silicon panels, that isn't the case. And we're going to have a problem when we start having lots of panels coming offline and hitting um, and, and, and going to landfill. Uh, and finally, module replacement schemes for cheap technologies like this can actually become quite viable that you could deploy technology like this for 10 years, for example, and then replace it with um, a newer technology um, or, or the newer, better model of that technology, which is actually viable if, if the panel is cheap enough like they are here. So with that, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening and, and thank you to funders and various collaborators who have contributed to this work uh, and I'll happily take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, if anyone has questions, can you please raise your hand? So these uh, de defects you were talking about, uh, and yep. the little grains that don't produce light, etc., uh, these traps, these are the things that in, uh, protect you from uh, reaching a higher efficiency, right? Yep. And to solve these, you've got you, you investigating what can you do about this? Yep. Uh, how are you? And you said 
the whole perovskites are easier to produce than silicon because you don't need as pure and intensive conditions. Yeah. So will this mean that the ideal high efficiency perovskite will eventually have to be produced in some sort of extremely controlled setting? Or is there some yeah. something fundamental yeah. that this is actually not that important, as you said? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think, so the short answer is no, they won't have to be produced at the high temperatures. And, partly because they do crystallize at much lower temperatures, so you don't need to. Um, in terms of the, the defects, the, there's some very specific ones that remain. These are these, these nanoscale impurities that I showed. And it looks like with, with some additives and a few other things, we can get rid of them. So it looks like with some sort of novel chemistry, we, we probably will be able to solve them without changing how we manufacture them, for example. Um, and and the sort of, for context, I mean, they are, their performance is sort of you know, at the silicon level now, so it means if we push them a bit higher, you know, that, that we're, we're already at a level where it will be certainly competitive. A uh, uh, question on Zoom. Um, one of your earlier slides showed that commercial scale uh, photovoltaics was already competitive with fossil fueled electricity generation, or domestic roof, rooftop was not. Yeah. While your new technology could perhaps make rooftop generation competitive, should we instead be investing in commercial scale perovskite cell development and generate even more energy for the same amount of capital? Um, yeah, so the question, so that was about whether just to commit to crystalline silicon and making it the commercial, so the rooftop systems better, was that right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so it's a good question. I mean, I think the reality is we need to do as much solar as we can, and that's both, that's rooftop, that's utility scale, that's commercial systems. Um, silicon will keep getting better and it will keep improving as well in parallel. So it's sort of not, not that, you know, we're gonna completely give up on silicon technologies and they're gonna become redundant. It's that will keep improving too. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, the, the reality is we need high efficiency. That's where you really get the sort of, you, you really start to break into these balance of systems costs. And, um, and also it means for every square meter, you are producing more, more, more power. And so high efficiency is really where the future is. And that's, that's including these new technologies. We need these new technologies as well to get there. Uh, so, yeah. I realize this is a little bit uh, off, uh, off, off your main line of thinking, but if we're really to, you know, get to 2050, we're going to have to sort of start putting these solar farms in places like the Sahara Desert and sending yep. the current into Europe. Now, how realistic do you think that is? I mean, given that it's yep. the the infrastructure that goes with it? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a good question. I think a lot of it's about transmission as well. I mean, there's the geopolitical issues as well and, and whether whether it's feasible, but um, at least in terms of transmission, there has been progress. With the, so high voltage DC, for example, is feasible. Um, but I think that the reality is um, a lot of the, you know, the models for solar don't require that sort of thing. It, it just requires, you know, us having, I mean, in the UK, for example, there'll be a mix of, there'll be lots of wind. Wind's gonna be huge part of what we're playing and there'll be solar, but we don't need to necessarily go to things like big solar farms that mean we're, you know, sort of, we need to leverage other spaces other than what we have. Um, and, and I suppose also, you know, the, these high efficiency technologies also means, you know, for every rooftop we are producing more power, so we are gonna make more bang for, you know, for every square meter of solar we already have um, in sort of more urban settings. But this yeah. is not gonna work without batteries. We yeah. Have, no matter how much solar we yeah. Have, we still have downtime. Absolutely. So, so storage is the other essential element to you know that we need, and and you know that there is good progress in that, but it is it is slow, and you know these technologies are the, the storage technologies are still very expensive, but I think um, I think that will be coming down quite a lot. Uh, yeah. Ah. Um, yep. My mind is a general question too. Um, I, I started campaigning on green and sustainability issues in the early 80s. By about 1995, I concluded that the human race was too stupid to save itself. Um, so uh, 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 not only were, not, were young people not interested, but the scientific community seemed to be stuck on large hadron colliders and dark matter and fusion power. Uh, uh, and, and so it, it needed some sort of, the sort of quantum shift that you're illustrating today uh, not only your talk, but the but the girl before as well, mm -hmm. uh, of actually addressing the real practical issues and applying science. Do you feel now that the human race has the intelligence to save itself? It's a very good question, a very bold question. I, 
I mean, I, I'm optimistic. I think, I mean, I, I think in terms of the technologies that are coming through, they, they will take time to come through. That's the, that's the thing. And we do need to, you know, do it as quick as we can. But I think with um, at least the decarbonisation models you do see from the renewable side, we can certainly get there, I think. Um, the, the, the big question will be a lot of those, I mean, a lot of those do rely on carbon capture, you know, technologies that don't exist yet. And what we need to do is be able to develop technologies like this that mean we don't have to rely at all on carbon capture or we can you know really minimally rely on that to get to where we need to be by 2050 uh, so I, yeah I, I'm optimistic but it, it's there's, there's a lot of work to be done to get there yeah I was astonished at your figures saying the payback time of different systems is one and a half or point three years what yep. is the context, please, of that payback time? Is yeah, that so, just the array or the whole thing? So that, that is, because um, so it, it, it varies a lot depending on where you are in terms of the payback time. So if you're in a very sunny place, that payback time will, at least even for silicon, will come down. So those, those numbers, just to recall exactly, uh, I believe it's averaged across sort of, you know, insulation around the world. So solar, what, you know, what you'd be seeing are averaged across the world. So it's, it's, in some ways, it's a useful number. In other ways, it's, it's, you know, you really do need to delve into every specific geographic location will have a very different payback time. But the reality is the perovskite will always be lower than the silicon one. But when you start to get to, you know, six-month payback time for silicon, it's sort of in the noise a little bit, whether one month versus six months is actually huge dif a huge difference there. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. You've shown that because of their flexible and lightweight, they can be applied in many more settings than silicon uh, panels, yeah. including roofs, windows, blinds, curved surfaces. Yeah. There's been a discussion, sort of, and there is, a, as you said, there's a lot of places we could be putting stuff on roof tiles. Do you think yeah. uh, there is a potential, and there's been lots of kind of false prophecies about? When you imagine all the kind of concrete and infrastructure and, and especially road surfaces, yeah. will perovskites are a fund could they eventually be placed somewhere like that, or is there some sort of uh, they're not durable cost, enough? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I I think it's there. What you know, the cost whether the cost will will, will allow it in terms of the infrastructure of you know changing the the structure the, the sort of you know what the road is because you need transparent um, glass probably. To, to cover the roads, and I don't think that's going to be practical. Um, and it, I mean, the other aspect is the mechanical issues, you know, and, and whether you would, you know, whether it would, they would end up being able to last long enough. Um, the, in terms of the sort of other applications, I mean, the, the building integrated is very good, except you're not generating as much power um, because you have to make them different colors so they're not optimized for harvesting light. Um, so in reality, all of that will be good, but really, it's sort of you know the, the the rooftop and utility scale solar where we really you know generate lots and lots of power. Where it's going to make a difference. Um, yeah, so you know I mean it's it's good. They do it does open up possibilities in different spaces. Like you know at least thinking beyond what silicon can do. But the reality is probably you know most things will be more traditional PV type farms. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, and um, I think your group is testimony to the fact that humans can solve uh, this problem, and um, I love how you place your collaborators in their little flags from all over the world, so this is uh, <laughs> yeah. a very, very positive sign. Thank you for your presentation. I, might, uh, I have two questions. Um, uh, one is, so I come from a quantum computing background, and um, I'm aware of uh, um, recent work in quantum biology where they show nature sometimes uses quantum effects, for example, with um, uh, chlorophyll-like molecules mm -hmm. uh, being very good antennas because of decoherence. Yep. Does that explain some of the, this um, amazing um, efficiency that you're seeing because of, uh, yeah. surprising efficiency you're seeing because of heterogeneity? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, you do, yeah, I mean, the, the, you do get some sort of confinement effects and things like that where you do get some quantum effects. But, but I think most of it is, you know, it's the fact that most defects are not not problematic and so they're sort of acting like traditional semiconductors in the sense that you know we're absorbing light into a semiconductor and energizing electrons and it's the fact that most of the defects that are produced are, they're quite shallow actually energetically so if a charge traps it can detrap um, back again 
Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and there is some interesting work looking at artificial kind of, you know, mimicking photosynthesis and things like that. And um, at least from a, from a directly generating electricity, that's not going to be probably a very efficient way. But where it does become interesting is thinking about solar fuels and, and converting, um, you know, sort of harvesting light and then doing, um, producing hydrogen or other chemicals and other fuels where, where you know, that's sort of an interesting aspect because then you can think about storage as well directly generated from the from, from um, illumination from from light yeah. and then in terms of designing um, or finding new compounds and, and new designs um, yeah. you may have heard that one application of quantum computing is the design of photovoltaic cells um, yes would you think would you agree that, uh, with that um, application or is it just hype I'm P curious possibly to... I mean there's there is I mean because even just this material family, but there's other material families where there's a huge space to explore in terms of compositions, in terms of band gaps and things like that. So, there, I mean, and there is some work being done on that where sort of screening through different compositions, um, often using sort of machine learning algorithms to sort of screen through material sets. And, um, and I think the interesting thing is it hasn't really come up with much yet. And, and, and maybe the yet is, a, is an important thing because I think it will be important. Um, and also it'll be important for, you know, other applications as well, not just solar. So thinking about you know other sort of optoelectronic materials that can, you know, that, that can either harvest light or can um, transport charges, for example, for new transistors and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's at least in the sort of exploring new material space, I think there is an important application there. So yeah, those are my two uh, technical questions. On a last high-level question, why isn't it the case that? Uh, um, Perovskites are the clear winners, and, and I know you said we need silicon, but why not? Just yep. in the future, this is the clear, is this the clear winner out of all technologies? Uh, well, and no, I think I mean I think it's still work to be done to say whether it will be. I mean, it it really is the reliability, and 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 it's very difficult to say this technology is going to last for 25 years. And in fact, you know, even in a lab, if we do accelerated tests, it's very hard to convince an insurer to underwrite that. So it's going to take you know a combination of of still many more years of development to get there, but also field testing. We're, um, even silicon cells, a lot of the failure me mechanisms weren't discovered until they're out in the field operating for years, and then other failure mechanisms came up that they've since um, alleviated. But yeah, so I think there's sort of, you know, there's, uh, at least for perovskites, there's still some space to go, some way to go. There are other technologies as well. There's a few other thin film ones that also will be important, but it's sort of unclear whether they'll, they can get to the scale um, just because of some of the components in them um, that, that the perovskites could get to. Um, but my, in reality, we need, we need to progress on all of them. We need to push out these technologies as fast as we can. Uh, crystalline solar panels for silicon. Um, they have issues with partial shading on the panel as well as heat in hot environments. How would having yep. a, a tandem perovskite silicon solar cell uh, specifically proscite address those two problems of the partial yep. heating, a, partial shading and, and the heating of the... Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, shading is an issue and there's, um, I mean, there's some interesting progress that's made on sort of bypass diodes that help counter that even in silicon cells. Um, in terms of the heating, because there's an issue where in silicon cells, as they get hotter, they get less efficient. And so that, that would still be there in a proscite silicon panel. Um, a proscite, proscite panel, that wouldn't be there because the proscite actually has a, it, it gets slightly better with temperature. Um, rather than drops off in efficiency. So it could be, you know, some of the, the, the yeah. Um, and, and even actually, interestingly, for electric vehicles, some of the, it actually gets to even hotter temperatures than on rooftops because you have a sort of the greenhouse effect. So some of these cells, you know, they, they do have to operate at quite high temperatures um, already. And, it, and the perovskites do look promising in that sense. Cool. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to end it there, but with one last question. Um, yep. So you mentioned at the beginning the um, meeting the global demand of solar cell uh, solar, uh, solar power being 20 ter terawatts. How much of a role do you think perovskite solar cells will play in that? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's a globally we're sort of it's probably going to be somewhere on the order of sort of 10 terawatts of PV is going to be needed, um, and um, it, it's hard to say exactly, you know by 2050, but it sort of you know it could well provide half of that at least, or at least um, or, or, or perhaps even more. Um, but you know, to, to get to 10 terawatts, we sort of almost have to hit a terawatt per year by the end of the decade. And at the moment, we've only installed one terawatt, or not even a terawatt yet. So it's, you, just sort of, you can see the scale of the problem and how much we do need to deploy to get there. Um, 
thank you very much everyone for attending a special thank you to sam strengths as well so thank you very um, much and also to csar for helping us uh, during the event as well uh, so thank you all for attending can we all give one last round of applause to sam strengths thank you